I think we're about ready to start. I'm just looking at the online. So, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Morten Meyerhoff Nielsen. I'm with uh, the United Nations University's e government unit in Portugal. This is, I'll be the moderator for this session. We have three panelists joining online. The session is organized with Unecker, and Magda Sek is here to represent that, and we'll do the welcome. Uh, and then we'll start the discussion, including with our three online panelists. Thank you very much, uh, and good morning, good afternoon, where you are, uh, to be part of this important workshop uh, talking on focus on digital transformation. I think uh, we all agree that uh, digital transformation can play an important role for achieving this sustainable development goal, as well as the aspiration of uh, uh, African Union uh, Agenda 2063. And uh, since uh, the beginning we are in this uh, IGF uh, forum, let's start since 2005. Since 2005, we have uh, African country have made a lot of progress uh, on uh, their digital agenda because we come to around 6% internet access. And today we are at 40% uh, uh, people connected uh, on internet. But uh, it is, uh, but we, we also we have uh, several challenge uh, because 60% uh, of our population are offline. It is something we need to think about. Is to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to pose as a question, uh, to ask us one question, is if uh, our digital policy are adequate to the need of African country. Second, this uh, digital divide also remain a big challenge in the continent between the urban city and the rural area also because the rural area is connected around 23 percent also we have this uh, digital gender gap 45 percent of men are connected compared to 34 percent women there is a gap of 11 percent and still uh, we have 500 million people without any legal form of identity Another one, it is a cyber security key, also remain a big challenge. As you know, cyber security cost to last year 10% of our GDP, African GDP. It is a lot to compared to other sector. We need also to begin to find how we can uh, develop uh, adequate uh, digital transformation strategy. Uh, we have capacity to leverage uh, this digital technology to mitigate the climate change, digital technology to assist youth and women to be part of this four industrial revolution. As you know, we have 70% of our population will be youth by 2050, and it will represent 42% of the world youth. And we need to build their capacity on this uh, four industrial revolution. Also, we are facing a lot of challenge also on this emerging technology, like this generative artificial intelligence. We need to focus to, st to think about what kind of regulation we have to put in place to take benefits of all opportunity offered by this uh, emerging technology. Our data governance also need to be reviewed B with this uh, development, this advanced technology we, uh, and the development of AI also. We need to support African country to implement this data governance framework to ensure this uh, digital sovereignty happen in the continent. It is a key area where uh, we want to have a discussion today with our several partners. We have a lot of partners around this uh, platform. Uh, some are here in person, as uh, are in, uh, in uh, online. And we have also, we acknowledge the presence of the parliamentarian, African Parliamentarian Network in this room, as well as GIZ. We have our, uh, our partner, the U.S. Embassy, as well as UN, Univers UN University, to be part of this interesting discussion, as well as uh, uh, the authority in Gambia and in Cabo Verde. And once again, thank you all to be there, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. 
Um, so before we start, I'd like to introduce the, the panel. Uh, I'll start with our colleagues online. We have John Kruj, uh, who is the National Director of State Modernization at the Ministry of Modernization of the State and Public Administration in Cabo Verde. He is currently eight hours behind us, so he's up very early. Um, we are also joined by Rose uh, Miner. I apologize, Rose, for the mispronunciation, I think. Uh, Rose is the Deputy Commissioner at the Office for Data Protection Commission in Kenya. Um, with us today, we also have the, um, we have uh, Anand, who is the, at the US mission to the African Union, Addis Ababa, and particularly also dealing with privacy and security issues in the digital space. We have Magda, who is from uh, our colleagues at UNECA. Uh, Magda is the, the Director for Technology and Innovation at UNECA. And then last but not least, my colleague, Deputy Director Luis Barbosa at UNUE Gap. As Magda has already hinted at, we have a number of sort of key questions around the digital transformation strategies uh, in Africa in particular, uh, not only around governance and intergovernance, but also the collaboration and coordination of these digital strategies in the domestic context, uh, both in terms of the immediate but also medium and long-term strategic focus, and not least how to build these whole of government digital ecosystems that we hear so much about in order to allow for both service production and service delivery based on data, identities, signatures, et cetera. So asking the audience, and, and let's start with you, Jaume, first, what are the sort of three key opportunities that Cabo Verde is currently focusing on in, in the digital space? And what are the associated challenges that you are, are, are tackling at the moment? Uh, first of all, I don't know if you hear me. We hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I would uh, like to thank for, for the invitation first. Um, as you know, Cap Verde um, is an African country uh, outside the continent, and we have a specific uh, particularities. Uh, but uh, we still have, I think, the same uh, challenges and we have uh, some opportunities that maybe uh, are different from from other countries. So right now, um, the enhancing the service delivery is is one of the uh, of the thing that is it's a big opportunity for us uh, because compared to since the um, the early twenties uh, uh, start uh, the digitalization of the of the government. And uh, we have a lot of, of back office um, infrastructures, so um, and applications. And right now uh, we have a big opportunity to take advantage of, of, of that. We have a lot of data. Uh, we have a lot of application. Uh, and we just need right now to cross this information across the government and uh, build some uh, service uh, for the citizen in, in line in terms of, of the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, services. We, we have another uh, big opportunity related um, to the um, digital identification. Uh, right now we have a new uh, digital ID uh, based on, the, on, on, a, on a mobile. Uh, we call it mobile key um, based on digital certificates. And uh, Kevert have a, a, a very good system in terms of the identification, the data that we have in our data, database for for the identification of the of the of the people is unique, and um, it's a big opportunity for us um, to 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 build and have uh, the, the the services for for uh, the, peop the people that, that we have in our country. As an example, we launched in the, um, three months ago a service uh, that is the criminal hacker online. So um, the people right now can um, ask for their criminal hacker. Um, 
they just need to to have this this digital id strong digital id based on on digital certificates so this is another uh, big opportunity for us i think and um i would say you have another big uh, opportunity based on a digital ecosystem that we are uh, creating here in Cap Verde. Uh, we are uh, finishing our new technological, uh, digital technological park, uh, where you we will have a lot of companies um, and the government as well will have uh, all, all the, the data in this uh, technological park. Um, it's, it, it's a very um, good uh, project that we implemented. Uh, with this, we implement as well uh, the, the telecommunication through the new cable LLink. We are working with our local uh, regional uh, countries to another cable called Amilcar Cabral. So um, we created the foundation. This technological park have three uh, new, two new data centers to, 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 to put with the other one that we already have. So uh, we create all the foundations, I think, uh, for for um, to build a strong ecosystem and have startups uh, um, in this process as well. Uh, so I think for us it's it's another big um, opportunity. And in terms of the challenge, uh, we have the digital literacy. It's it's first I think for us. Uh, as I say, we launched a, a new services with the the mobile key. Uh, but we still have some uh, problems with with the use of of these new uh, services and these new fixtures. Um, the people need to, to 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 have more skills to use these tools um, and to use the internet for more productivity. Um, most of the people use internet for social media and things like that. So um, we are working for a program. Um, to 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 increase this digital literacy across all the, our citizens, um, we have another uh, the cyber security. You 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 talk about this the introduction. Uh, cyber security is a, is another big challenge as well. Um, but we we are uh, putting a strong efforts on on this to implement, for example, our CSERT. Um, but it's still uh, a, a, a big challenge for, for us. Um, in 2020, we have a major attack for our systems because we have a lot of systems in the government. Um, but we deal with it very, very good, I think. But um, it still have uh, it's still a, a, a very good ch challenge for us, um, and. Uh, to finish uh, the change management. Um, implementing the, the digital transformation uh, will require us uh, a shift uh, in terms uh, of the organizations and the way the organizations um, talk here. Uh, we have uh, some silos, we still have some silos in, inside the government. So it's for us um, a challenge to enforce this 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 digital uh, transformation uh, because we have some resistance in terms of the employees. Um, we know that some of this resistance is related to the skills as well. Um, and uh, this is why uh, this this change management uh, it's part of our uh, key um, things that we have to do that is our, one of our most challenge, uh, I think, in this in this digital uh, transformation, um, I think it is is this. We are a, a very young um, country, and we still have we still have an. Uh, this is another opportunity. I think we have a, a population that is it's it's young, uh, but. Um, we are not taking uh, that advantage that I think we, we could take from from this this population, this young population. So um, I still fall from, I, I think it's 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 enough for now. Uh, we Thank you, Jam. We'll have a couple of rounds uh, on, on these topics. Uh, so, so Rose, we heard Jam talk about some of the opportunities like 
technology as an opportunity, data as an opportunity, uh, both in terms of the transformation of, of how government operates, how government provides services, inter the internal production, the, the data delivery. We also hear about how technology can be used in, in the pub, pub private sector. From, from the data perspective, and from your perspective in the Data Commission and, and in East Africa, are you seeing similar opportunities being discussed and captured? Are you seeing similar challenges? Um, what, what's your perspective on, on, on the opportunities and challenges? Again, from the Data Commissioner's perspective, but also the broader Kenyan public sector and, and private sector perspective. Um, absolutely, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it is a uh, privilege to be on this panel. Um, just starting by saying that Kenya has had an opportunity, um, I guess, to have a digital transformation strategy or have um, a recognition of the opportunities that ICTs and digital tools can actually have in lip-forking the economy. Um, so not only is it um, in Kenya that a digital transformation strategy was um, um, established, I think, uh, by as way of a blueprint in 2019, but since... Um, I think 2012, um, Kenya had in its vision 2030, this is a strategic um, goal for, for, for the um, period of 2012 to 2030. We recognized that ICTs are crucial in ensuring that Kenya can leapfrog and become a uh, middle income economy. Um, and so this has been um, something that has been included in every single strategic plan, um, as well as a national um, um, goals for the period until today. Um, in the national strategies today, we have a lot of um, ambitious, but um, I, you know, work that is is going on where we look at um, you know a digital super highway, which is um, enhancing our um, um, national fiber um, optic backbone. Uh, by 100,000 kilometers. We have digital literacy programs. We um, currently have over 5,000 um, services um, available online to citizenry. Um, uh, obviously, the usage of, of data and data governance structures are critical um, in ensuring that this is actually um, being rolled out in an ethical, um, a legal, lawful manner. Um, and so one of the things that actually came about when recognizing that digital transformation was important for Kenya is there was the enactment of the data protection laws, um, as well as the establishment of the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, which is where I work. Um, now, one of the things that we have seen, even as we go about um, um, harnessing the opportunities, so we've talked about digital identities, we've spoken about um, you know, one-stop shop um, for, for digital services, digital literacy, um, infrastructure challenges, as well, so infrastructure opportunities. So we've got um, the Concert Technopolis that has um, a cloud service provision um, in Kenya um, and a lot of host, a host of other infrastructure um, um, developments as well that are happening. One of the things that we've seen the Kenyan government actively take um, on board is ensuring that the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner in terms of usable or um, um, best use for the data that they're collecting is actually done or involved um, in that process. So um, in digital um, IDs, um, in terms of ensuring that not only are the opportunities captured, but also the risks are actively managed, um, this is something that is at the forefront um, in that respect. Um, and so whilst there are a lot of opportunities that have been harnessed um, um, through this digital transformation, again, as I've said, I, I think Kenya was um, in 2019 um, uh, one of the first countries to develop a blueprint um, on digital, the digital economy. And this was a blueprint that was launched um, in Smart Africa and then, I guess, cascaded um, or, 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 or shared with the rest of Africa. And I believe that it um, enabled um, the AU um, digital transformation strategy as well and formed part of the material that actually ensured that that was happening. Um, and so Kenya has recognized um, the opportunities of digital transformation. One of the challenges that we do find, and this is something that is unique not only to Kenya, but Africa at large, 
is a digital divide. Um, so this comes in many forms and it's being tackled in a number of ways, but there's still a need, um, I guess, for collaboration, both the private sector aspect and the uh, public sector aspect is ensuring not only are we connecting people, um, not only are they literate, but do they have the relevant devices to actually ensure that they're using the services um, um, effectively, um, that they are, um, you know, taking on board, that they're really um, able to participate in the digital economy. So the transformation doesn't just happen on the government level for the people that can um, access, but also for, um, as has been said, for women, um, youth, as well as people in underserved um, areas. And that is something that is is being tackled um, through rollout of uh, more fiber optic finding um, opportunities, I guess, as well, to ensure that schools, for example, are connected, that actually govern or um, affect um, the communities around them. So it's not just for a particular school, but people can actually um, benefit from that. Um, there's also um, ensuring that there is rural awareness when it comes to education and finding um, cheaper alternatives. And, and, and I think this is um, uh, an area where private sector has really come in um, for people to have mobile devices um, that are capable um, of enabling uh, individuals that are in underserved economies to also access the services that are provided online, but also the opportunities in terms of um, work as well, um, remote work um, um, and things like this, um, financial inclusion, um, just generally uh, digital business and opportunities that will affect on a private sector aspect to boost the economy and enable individuals to, to participate in the digital economy and, and reap the benefits of digital transformation in Kenya. Thank you, Rose. Um, Jam mentioned the, the change management challenge uh, in, in a number of ways, which you also have alluded to. Is, is that something that you also observe in the Kenyan context that, yes, we want to innovate, yes, we want to change, but the management of that change can often cause a bit of resistance or a few challenges within organizations, public as well as private. Is that something you see? It's something we definitely see outside of Africa, in, in Europe or in Asia or in Latin America, that not all organizations uh, are equally open to, to the positive change or, or any disruption to, to business continuity. Uh, this can also be a political concern for service delivery that innovation and change may cause disruption to, to business processes um, in, a, in, a, in a period of time. Is that something you see, particularly when it comes to the utilization of technology and data? Um, one of the things that we have noted, um, again, as I said, Kenya is, uh, or, or maybe I haven't touched on it, but Kenya prides itself as being the silicon savanna. Um, technology has been embraced in Kenya in a way that um, it might not be embraced in, in other countries. And so even as um, government and private sector, in fact, private sector and government are the ones who are pushing for this digital change, um, you will see um, in digitizing lands records and digitizing um, IDs, this is actually a push that is coming from government um, and a lot of public sector or private, sorry, a lot of private sector had already adopted um, innovative change. And so this this makes a um, easier transition for digital transformation because there is a push not just outside government, but by the people to embrace technology um, in a manner that might not necessarily be seen in other, say, for example, Eastern African countries. Um, however, um, one of the things that we are seeing, um, and this is not um, particularly an issue of resistance, but mostly a, a, an issue of um, newness of policies and newness of legislative frameworks. So for example, when it comes to data governance, um, when it comes to data protection, um, unlike in European countries um, or um, Asian countries um, or just, just Western countries at large, um, data protection specifically hasn't been something that had um, that is, you know, um, that is transformed or has evolved over a period of years. We have in Kenya, for example, a data protection bill that came in um, three years ago that has pushed people to actually look at data governance in a different form, in a different way. Um, so the resistance comes from a lack of education or a lack of, um, um, I guess, I, I want to call it indoctrination of, of principles of data protection and data governance rather than um, a resistance to actually change. Um, and so one of the things the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner has done is 
push um, awareness so that people understand the benefits um, of data protection, the benefits of data governance, rather than looking at it as another um, regulatory um, hurdle that they have to bypass when it comes to um, usage of information. Um, so this is something that we're actively working on. Um, to some extent, there's change management, but I think it's also the sensitization of the benefits um, comes comes in as a, as a big um, um, contributor and something that is, is being worked on. Thank you very much for that, Rose. Uh, it actually is a nice bridge to Anand that actually comes from the U.S. Ministry of Justice, but is is working with the African Union mission in Addis Ababa on similar topics. How does these two national cases uh, from Cabo Verde and Kenya sort of resonate with you when when you're working with the African Union on frameworks? with respect to digital transformation or, or data or cybersecurity. Um, I'm asking about frameworks because a strategy is essentially a framework that is supported by action plan that is then you know, populated by, by different initiatives and activities. So, so how does these two national examples uh, resonate with you in the wider AU context and some of the things that you're doing and also your experience from the US and North America in general? Thank you. Uh, just a word about our program. I work with my colleague, Temiskin Lapiso, here. We're also in Addis Ababa. But um, we primarily do cybercrime training, and we have chosen to do it on a bilateral level. So I'm aware of what's going on in Kenya. Cabo Verde, as Jao mentioned, when they uh, was hit with a major attack in 2020, we know that same, that's the solar winds attack. Uh, greatly affected the United States as well. But we've taken the bilateral approach so we can hear the issues from each country. And what we hear is great commonality. If uh, we had gathered, say, people together regionally, we may not get the openness to discuss issues. But um, what we've seen in terms of digital transformation in an overall policy is digital transformation has tremendous potential to advance Africa. I know ECA has its uh, payment system that you're working on and advancing. But cybercrime, is, it's kind of like the break that's keeping digital transformation from advancing like it could. And for each country, there is, I think, more victimization than what is reported in any source you might find. It's, it's vastly underreported, and it's mainly mobile money schemes, but it's also every other type of cybercrime that affects other parts of the world. But there are unique challenges within legal frameworks of each country, and that's, that's part of the overall. Uh, for African Union, they are developing cybersecurity legal frameworks, including online protection of children. So we're not unique in what we do. We work together in this area with, we've done um, programs at ECA. We work with Interpol, GFCE, UNODC, and a number of players to advance all of this. Again, because the digital, Digital transformation has such potential for the economic benefit of Africa. That and the um, free trade within the continent initiative also that we see from AU and ECA. But so long as it's easy to victimize Africans and African nations, it's, it's never going to reach that potential. So that, I, that's really our focus, uh, advancing by uh, multilateral treaties such as the Budapest Convention. We also formed a cryptocurrency working group uh, within Africa. We have 27 members and most recently met at ECA in November where they discuss their cases and they have further training because cryptocurrency saw um, a greater adoption within Africa than probably most other places, mainly as a hedge against inflation and second, as a means of remittances for people who've gone to work elsewhere and want to be able to send money home with no 
no fees associated with it. So we're, we're happy to work with these partners within that framework of digital transformation, but our focus is on the cybersecurity, cybercrime angle. Uh, we're just waiting for the Gambian minister to actually join us virtually. Um, no, there's a technical problem, so we'll see if we can solve it, but actually we had the minister for ICT from Gambia to join us virtually, but there's a technical problem this morning. It is also very early in Gambia. It is the middle of the night. Um, Luis, uh, at UNUEGov, uh, you work, we work a lot with governments globally, including in both Northern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So how does uh, JAMS reflections, announced reflections, and also Rose's reflections resonate with you in a wider African context, considering countries as diverse as Egypt, Uganda, Mozambique, Sao Tome and Principe that we've all been working with to some degree? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? What are some of the solutions that you see are coming out from different national governments uh, to, to these challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much, Morten. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I think the global changes are, uh, challenges are well known. Okay, beginning at the beginning, uh, the needs for robust, trustworthy digital infrastructure, um, expanded connectivity, um, data policy frameworks, as we have been discussing in the previous session, and then all the key enablers for uh, a meaningful digital transition. Uh, digital identity, cybersecurity, uh, interoperability. Um, okay, all, all these, uh, all, all the challenges I think are, 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 are very well known. Um, what I, I, I also think that should be emphasized is, is that even if challenges seem overwhelming at some point, the experience of some countries, and we have been listening to João and to Rose, the experience of some countries uh, show that, in fact, a lot can be achieved. And that this is also our experience at NUE Gov. Uh, actually, Africa has um, several problems, several weaknesses, but also obvious leapfrogging opportunities. Um, less legacy challenge than in other parts of the world, a vibrant youth, and so on and, and so forth. From um, the, the point that I, I, I would like to emphasize in um, addressing your question is the, and, and because it's also <laughs> our job at WNU is the, the, the crucial role that digital governance can play in the digital transition processes. And w w what I think, and we, ha we have been, for example, following very closely the case of Cape Verde, but uh, also others, and the, I think th digital governance actually can play a very interesting um, role as a kind of a plastic layer enforcing in practice, in practice an articulation between three different sorts of objectives. First of, all, first of all, in improving the effectiveness of government and public administration, which is actually crucial as a cornerstone for development. Uh, you know, all, all these, uh, I, I can mention, for example, things like improving revenue mobilizations or target efficient investments, all these kinds of things. So this is absolutely crucial. Another, another class of objectives relating to bringing the state close to citizens, and for example, um, our colleagues in Cape Verde have been very, very motivated by this, uh, to their needs, to their expectations, making concrete improvements in concrete lives, and I think this should be stressed. And finally, and this is the case of Cape Verde, this is also the case of Gambia, and I, I, I hope the minister will be able to, to talk, in articulating digital governance and digital transition in general with broader development objectives, namely to create ecosystems for digital economy to flourish. Um, that is uh, also, I think, the AU vision, and I, 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 I quote from the, the strategy, to strengthen the economic sector, enable its diversification and development, and placing African countries as producers, and not only as consumers in global economy. So I think these three uh, kinds of objectives and their coordination are really crucial to, 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 to the success of, of digital transition, seen from the perspective of digital governance. That's my Thanks, Luis. Uh, Matthias, I see you nodding. Um, 
Juneka has worked also with the African Union on different types of frameworks. Uh, one of the more recent one is the AU Digital Transformation Strategy Framework for 2020-2030. Um, the aim of this is how to help countries prioritize their needs. Prioritization is difficult in all governments globally. Uh, resource constraints, human resource constraints is often a challenge we see in all countries globally. So how do you, s what are the key components in these frameworks that UNECA have helped develop or they have seen countries apply in Africa? What are the components that are really beneficial to them? Uh, and, and, and how has it helped them overcome challenges? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, first, on this uh, AU digital transformation strategy, we have uh, several components who can help uh, African country to, to, to use this uh, digital technology to achieve their sustainable development goal. But let, let's start when we define, uh, when we implement this uh, digital transformation at the national level. I think if we have uh, there is we one challenge, one key challenge, it is at the coordination level at the member state. Uh, and now we we have not had a lot of progress because uh, in in this uh, forum you have the presence of a lot of members of parliamentary. It is something uh, we we have to highlight. Uh, but but because uh, government work on silo without involving uh, the parliament and the, at the end of day the law will be adopted by the parliamentarian. The involvement of the parliamentary in the development of the national digital strategy is very important as well as uh, uh, the private sector. For the, this national digital transformation as uh, several key pillars, well, going to digital finance, digital skills, innovation, development private sector, uh, capacity building, Etc. We have uh, several uh, challenges, and some country uh, we don't have. A, a country are are not at the same level of development of the digital transformation, and this uh, AU digital transformation provide a diagnostic and the gap of digital economy for the country, and define key priority for 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 the country. Some countries are their priority focus more on uh, developing the institutional framework what kind of entities they should have at the national level yeah, to develop this digital strategy. Because when you, wh when you look at some country, we, they have a ministry uh, in charge of uh, digital economy. And also they have a ministry in charge of ICT. There is a duplication we, we, and science and technology also. And we need uh, to have uh, a, a coordinated approach at the country level first to to, t to take benefits of this digital transformation. Also, some country, the issue it is uh, they don't have uh, the manpower or the resources to implement this digital strategy. And we need to focus on building a capacity. As a country, the problem is a gap on infrastructure. Of course, African country, a lot of African country has a gap of infrastructure, uh, but some countries, the gap is uh, more, more crucial. We need to focus what kind of policy in this digital transformation we put in place to overcome to this deficit, uh, that this lack of infrastructure. By re re revisiting the, regulated the regulation framework uh, to attract more investment. And we focus more to attract local investment first before attracting external investment. It is something very important on this uh, digital transformation. Also, for some country, key success it is how to promote innovation. When you you you, you have the case of uh, Morocco, of South Africa, of 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 Kenya, hmm? the need it is to promote innovation because there is a lot of uh, idea in ground in this country, a lot of development of the ecosystem, and we should do is adapt this digital eco this digital transformation strategy in promoting the development of innovation because we have a lot of things in the ground and we need to, to, to promote this innovation to take more benefits of this uh, digital uh, transformation. And uh, in general, uh, the opportunity is up to the situation of the country in terms of digital transformation as well as uh, the market uh, 
of this country if, if the market is big or the market is small because we can't compare uh, South Africa and, S and South Sudan uh, in terms of market and also in terms of capacity building we need we need to see which country are more focused uh, on capacity building to open uh, the, their uh, system to others why is this digital transformation we can say it is a complete uh, digital transformation it is a complete framework uh, to we can which can support african country to achieve their sustainable development from 2020 to 2030 i didn't forget also the cyber security it's very important because we if we don't secure this uh, digital space all policy we are doing also is up is, is not adequate as well as the issue of digi digital id i think we can uh, uh, come back later on digital id and digital threat Thank you. Uh, thank you, Makta. Uh, as a former civil servant at the Danish Agency of Digitization, which was embedded in the Ministry of Finance at the time, I know all about the financial challenges. Um, and, and one of the key tools that was applied there was actually these business case return on investments, where the challenge was that a project might be implemented in the strategy and funded, it's finished on time and on budget, but the benefit of the system only comes when it's operational. And that happens after the strategy period has closed. So the role was really finding models on how do we ensure that then the systems we have developed, the services we've launched, actually generates the outcomes, whether or not they're financial, productivity, or usability, uh, user-friendliness actually are achieved. And this is something that uh, we've, for instance, seen that the Botswanas are trying to, to work with. On that note, we actually like to open the, the floor. Um, we've been keeping an eye out on the chat online to see if there's anything, but there's no questions at there at the moment. So any, any questions, any contributions from the audience around these reflections around the, the challenges faced and how we can solve these challenges around change management related to the digital transformation, the, skill, the socioeconomic and digital divides, uh, we see within society when we are trying to, to facilitate a more digital enabled economy and private sector, uh, but also amongst our citizens and residents uh, in, in navigating these new technical solutions. Uh, any reflections for the audience? Please uh, put up your hand. Yeah, up if you can go to the microphone and introduce yourself and uh, your, your question. Hi, my name is Sam. Uh, Honorable Sam George, I'm a member of parliament from Ghana and the Secretary General of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. It's interesting listening to the conversation so far on the challenges. Um, we see a lot of digital transformation happening on the African continent and African governments. And listening to the challenges of cybercrime, for example, and how that is acting as a stumbling block to full adoption of uh, digital technologies. One of the challenges we have is with actually prosecution. Because you see, if you're not able to follow the full life cycle of fighting cybercrime by showing punitive action, people feel that the more I get digitally exposed, there's very little protection for me from the state. Now, one of the key components I realized is missing and the African Union data policy framework that we're not really focusing on is digital addressing addressing because on in many african countries there is no proper addressing system and so even when you are able to identify that a sim number we've registered all sim cards again most african countries have asked for registration of sim cards now even when there's a crime using a sim card and you report to the police the police is able to identify using the database of sim registry who the individual is but identifying or tracing that individual becomes a, cr a, a critical challenge. Now, because we have two issues, poor addressing system and then high residence mobility on the African continent. So the person lives in this community today, tomorrow he's moved to the next community. In Europe and the West, it, when you change residence, for you to even get at times your salary, you need to update a central database where your, your current addressing system is. So that's a critical thing we need to look at on the African continent, where we're able to put a location on every citizen. This is not surveillance, but to be able to know where every individual lives. 
because it helps you to provide safety nets. It helps you to also do law enforcement. And as we do this, we also need to look at the capacity building of our judges. Because the judiciary, most times, it's, it's fantastic that we've added the parliamentary track to the IGF, but we need to have possibly a judiciary track as well. Because the full life cycle is the executive bringing the, the legislation to parliament, parliament working with civil society to craft the frameworks and the legislation, but then the implementation of that legislation is by way of prosecutors and the judiciary in, in interpreting the legislation. So if you, don't have that f if you don't have that full cycle, that whole of community approach, we'll take fantastic steps, but we'll t just tick check boxes that say that we have the framework, but implementation is really challenged. Because for people to uptake this, it, it, there must be confidence in it. And so how we build confidence is critical to seeing uh, a spread of this digital uh, technologies and framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rose, Jiam, any observations on this challenge about uh, the sort of whole, the whole holistic approach to the digital transformation, both in terms of the example given from, from Ghana about the value of adequate data to both identify where the individual may be located if there's a crime happening, but also in terms of actually government planning and budgeting. If, if we don't know where our, our population lives, how can we as decision makers actually ensure that we build schools and hospitals in the right places, uh, that the staffing or call centers or physical service centers for those who do not interact online uh, or who are in a unique situation uh, have an alternative service challenge? Any thoughts on that and any, any solutions that you have explored domestically or that you know of in the African context or out, outside the African context? that would help address such, such challenges? Rose, then Jiao. Sure. Um, um, we um, in Kenya also struggle with that. One of the things that we noted um, when the um, digital um, economy blueprint was being developed is um, a need to have a national addressing strategy and a national addressing act that looks both at the national level and the county level um, so that we can have a repository of addresses. Um, it sounds like a very um, you know, simple thing to have for Western countries because this is something that has been ongoing, but for African countries, you know, um, Kenya in specific, uh, you know, when you're directing someone um, to identify where you live, you say, oh, you know, around that big tree and then there is a, a green gate, um, which firstly is impossible um, to then narrow down on where people live, but there is also an issue when it comes to, um, I guess, enforcement, there's an issue when it comes to um, uh, digital trade and e-commerce and things like this, delivery, postal um, um, services, for example, emergency services. Um, so it catches or captures not only um, aspects of, of, of um, I guess, enforcement, but very much just service delivery as well. Um, and so if there is a need for enhancement in service delivery, there is a need to identify where everyone is. Um, now, I think African countries have come up with a roundabout way of um, knowing where people are, but it's not necessarily efficient. So we rely on census, rely on, um, I guess, um, usage of service to understand how many people are in a particular area so that service can be rolled out to them. But I do feel that um, more and more um, there is a need for formal um, addressing services um, physically, but also the use of um, digital addressing um, um, services, which is something that is ongoing in Kenya as well as part of the um, strategy so that we're merging the digital and physical worlds to actually enable us to um, better serve um, um, the citizens. Uh, and so that's something that Kenya is grappling with and some of the solutions um, that have been put in to, to, to tackle that. And and Jaum, any any observations, any solutions to these type of challenges that that you've been been exploring in Cap Verde, or or that you've seen, for instance, in in the West African context? Um, hi, um, in Cap Verde, we, we we have this addressing uh, problem as well, but we are a very small country. This is one of big difference from the other countries. So for us to to know where some someone is 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 very easy it's not it's not that difficult because when you change you, you cannot go far 
from your your home. It's it's not uh, for us in terms of enforce the law. It's not it's not it's not a challenge uh, for us. I, I I think for for a bigger countries in, in Africa, uh, the digital the the digital addressing I think would be um, uh, the better uh, to to explore. But there's some challenges on, on on that as well because the data protection of the people uh, it could seems like a surveillance in terms of the for example do you tracking the SIM cards uh, that are registered here in Cape Verde you have to register as well your SIM card so uh, but could be it, it could, we could have some some problems in terms of the privacy so. Um, I think uh, the, the 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 countries they are uh, big uh, big in in Africa. Um, they they sh they could uh, go in this way, but um, they have to understand this the, the, this the privacy part how to manage it. Okay, Jim. Uh, thanks. We have a couple of other people in the audience that would like to to ask a question. We also have one online. Uh, if the two gentlemen at the mic would would just ask their questions quickly, and then I'll summarize the one online, and then we'll raise the panel. We'll do another round of questions later. So, um, go ahead. Thank you. My name is uh, Oliver Bamindu. I'm a member of Parliament from Cameroon. I I want to add my question, but start by thanking uh, Dr. Mata for the uh, for the engagement with uh, with ABNEC in uh, reinforcing the capacities of. Uh, members of parliament. But for a very long time, Africa has been uh, noticed for poor democracy, bad governance, and uh, corruption, and all and all. So I just want to, I just wanted to share, I, I just want to have this opinion on it, whether digital transformation can be, can be an instrument that will help uh, maybe uh, uh, advancement of uh, a kind of modern democracy in Africa, or I, 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 I don't know how to put it better. I just want to know whether digital transform can digital transformation be an instrument that can actually advance democracy in Africa. Thank you very much. And then the next gentleman, I'll summarize the questions. Thank you, uh, Bram from panel. Malawi. Um, so for me, I just I just wanted to find out if um, the AU has done a survey in terms of um, yes, we're advocating for digital transformation now, but we I think we can gain more if we have more members um, party to the Malabo Convention. Um, which currently is very slowly adopted in member countries. And so what is the impact of member countries not adopting the Malabo Convention? And as, as we're also pushing for the digitalization in the continent, do we see the imbalance? Are we taking stock of, uh, you know, these uh, you know, competing uh, interests? And, and what is the future looking like uh, with, with this kind of uh, speed? Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Honorable Alha Jimbo from the Gambia and also the um, Vice Chair of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Um, I'm sure we have some issue with the Minister, but I'm also the Chairperson of the Education Committee and ICT in the Gambia. So I'm really very familiar with what's actually happening in the transformation in the Gambia. Now, um, for us, just to make it very, very short, um, um, we have a very clear path and uh, we must thank ECA also for, for the guidance and also, also um, uh, um, the first thing is about the uh, national broadband network. Um, uh, we had a project called the ECOWAN, uh, which actually put you know you know uh, broadband across the country. Then on top of that, also Parliament also you know with the with the with the executive we work on the um, we call national broadband network, which actually put fiber across the country. And I think maybe in the next uh, year or so we may be the most. I'm a connected fiber in, you know, on, on the continent because it's a very small country like as well. Now, we, then we came up with a strategy as part of the digital transformation. We call it ICT for, for Master Plan, which actually have several components. One of them is about capacity development, um, STI, science, technology, innovation, and also youth and women, and uh, also the human capital, which is um, the capacity building we actually are doing, and uh, the e-agriculture, and uh, also the national broadband network strategies that we actually have in plan. Now, right now, where we are is um, about the digital addressing system. We have already started, and we have covered the capital and some of the biggest cities we have in the Gambia right now, where we have digital addressing system um, uh, that's in place right now. Uh, we are moving towards the digital ID, uh, which is also the consultancy was also already done with the help of the ECA also as well. Um, uh, that's exactly where we are as far as 
the transformation actually, you know, you know, is concerned. But one thing I would like to also um, put point out also is that along the way there are several issues, particularly the, the addressing system, which actually affects many countries in Africa. So again, technology is such a way that you don't actually have to, you know, start from zero. You are, you, you can take a leap, and that's exactly what Gambia is trying to do. We are taking a leap to ensure that we catch up with the with the rest of the world. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so just to summarize the questions, we, we had a question around how can technology potentially su support anti-corruption drives, uh, increase transparency, help embed sort of engagement, accountability, the, the democratic angles, and if so, how? We had a, a question online about the, the technopolitics between the global players in North America, Europe, in Asia, and how these dynamics may actually enable African countries to benefit, uh, multipolar, uh, if, if you want. And then there were some of the contributions uh, from Gambia around how, how the frameworks allows them to, to leapfrog, but it requires that you have some of the key enablers that Luis was also referring to in place. Yes, we need the infrastructure, but we also need it to be affordable, reliable, and have a population and, and a private sector that have the skills to use it and the skills in the public sector to actually facilitate and drive that transformation. Is there, is there any specific answers or any observations or contributions to those from the panel here in person and then online? Anand? I'm going to go rather quickly because I each one of the questions resonated. Sam's from Ghana talking, uh, we've done a lot of work in Ghana, but identity systems and the Western systems of addresses. This came up in a conversation with the AU when I brought up sex offender registration, which is something done in the United States, but in the context of most African nations would not work. But what we s might suggest are technical uh, and legal solutions. Technical, we're, we're talking to our FBI about what's called cell site triangulation, locating cell phones based on, yeah, you're, that's correct. And also circumstantial evidence. If someone committed a fraud, at some point they need to withdraw the money and almost every bank will have surveillance cameras. This is a technique of identifying an individual apart from having an address, physical address related to the IP. Um, question from uh, Oliver about, uh, was it about anti-corruption? Working with IOKO in Ghana and also in uh, Mauritius, their anti-corruption police in Nigeria, EFCC. I'll say this, we've assisted, every, many countries have specific anti-corruption units. We've assisted them with technical issues. I won't say which one, but one of them, based on several consultations, to help them get into a cell phone that removed their number two person in government. Uh, in Ghana, there, well, there was someone impersonating a high government official online, and we assisted in getting that removed. So there are, I would say, on from cybercrime, some technical uh, solutions, but I I'll finish with one other thing. You mentioned the need to train judges. Of the two, we took 12 African judges, prosecutors, investigators to the U.S. One of them suggested to us from Ghana that same need, but we see it everywhere. And here's the issue. We have very talented judges. There are two here, uh, one from Tanzania, Eliana. And they do something unique. They take professors who are skilled in tech and make them judges. Um, for other judges, if they don't understand it, they're more likely to keep things out. But judges don't want to be trained with prosecutors and investigators because it hampers their ability to ask questions. So what Temeskin, my colleague, is uh, we're developing a bench book and separate training for them. Other organizations are doing it too because they need their own training. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a, you know, it's a several uh, relevant uh, questions. First, uh, on the localization, 
I think we, we, we need to identify people before to localize them. And uh, we have uh, 500 million people eh, without uh, any f legal form of identity. It's difficult to identify them. Why I, our approach is to integrate this uh, digital addressing system in the digital ID project. It is something now we are going to do in uh, Gambia to integrate these two systems and maybe it will be helpful to identify and uh, localize uh, people. It is a big issue, not only in Africa, but in uh, several uh, developing countries. Coming to the, also there is a issue very important we have to take into course, there is an issue of disinformation we don't have now, and hard speech. We don't have any laws in the continent. Why I call upon you as parliamentary? <laughs> Uh, to start to think about on how we can uh, have a framework or guideline on this. Eh? Yeah, we are we are ready to work with you eh? to develop some guideline for the, for the continent. Something very important now because it uh, is a link to the democracy also. It is yeah, it is something we, we have the experience in now several country in 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 the continent. The the, the third point it is a. Uh, how digital technology can uh, contribute to fight uh, corruption. It's clear, yeah. Mm. Digital technology can uh, promote transparency hmm? and fight corruption. But for, for that, we need a commitment of the high level. I can give you an example. We receive a request from, uh, from one member state to support them to increase their tax revenue. And we develop a digital taxation system. When we, uh, when we develop digital tax taxation system, the government can, uh, we, uh, can get m uh, around 55% uh, additional revenue hmm? on the tax. When we present the project at the custom office, and also at the Ministry of Finance, they told they are not agree with this project because they can they, they are going to get problem with their, with their staff. <laughs> How we can <laughs> and the project they can't use they can't use the project it's not using eh? mm? another country it is the human resource uh, uh, management system at the government level. We find there are five people, five thousand people who get salary every month hmm, without uh, any presence in the ministry. Project close. <laughs> Project close. Hmm? Why we need, uh, we can talk about a lot on digital transformation. We have a lot of examples uh, in, in the world where this digital transformation promotes a lot of things about transparency, fight corruption, a lot of uh, benefits, uh, but without this uh, commitment, this leadership, and this uh, clear guidance, we can't go far off that. I call upon you, Parliament, to discuss with the government <laughs> to make sure we can use this digital technology. The solutions are there for, 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 for transparency. Something very important. D data governance also, it is very important. We talk about this uh, cyber security. Hmm? We have a lot of uh, platform around the continent, e-commerce platform, digital ID, digital, uh, digital public infrastructure across the continent. But we need to have this digital sovereignty. It's important. Otherwise, we are not going to take benefits of uh, this uh, digital uh, transformation. Digital sovereignty means uh, the data should be owned by African country. We, we, we need this data to create a job opportunity for our new generation. Yeah. We need this data to protect our citizens. Citizens should trust the government. Yeah. Without that, this digital, this digital transfer will be just uh, something uh, <laughs> we talk about for, for years and years, and there is no opportunity and benefits for the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Uh, Luis, uh, if, you, if you'll contribute, it, we have the minister online, so, um, okay. So, um, 
the Gambian Minister for, uh, for Communication and Digital Economy should be online now, uh, the Honorable Osman Barr. Uh, I hope you can hear us. We've been discussing the national experiences and approaches to enabling the digital transformation. Uh, a member of your parliament is actually with us here in person and gave us some highlights as well. But what are the key tools that you're using in the ministry to sort of drive this whole of government, whole of society digital transformation in Gambia? We heard about the importance of the infrastructure and the skills already, but are there any tricks up your sleeve that you have found to work better than others? And if so, what are they? Okay, um, thank you um, to all the audience on in Japan. Um, just, I'm stepping in for the Honorable Minister Usman Ba. I am Lamin Kamara, the Permanent okay. Secretary of the Ministry. And uh, I want to thank Honorable Mbo for that intervention. I think um, he's quite aware with what is happening in the ICT landscape in the country and has been uh, is the chairman of the educational ict subcommittee of the of the national assembly so we work very closely with him so i'm not surprised that he can make that intervention while we were waiting to get the opportunity to c come in um yes when the ministry we have the minister of communication and digital economy is just a year old and when the minister was appointed um he came with his five point agenda and I think we've already um, discussed um, some of those, which includes um, the connect addressing connectivity. Um, that is one, and how to ensure our people are connected, inclusive connectivity, and also regional connectivity has been key. We're working with the likes of Cape Verde and other ECOWAS countries on the America Cabral cable to provide a sec second submarine cable for the for the Gambia to create um, more um, capacity and also redundancy for the existing age submarine cable we have in place. We have also worked on a digital master plan and uh, we, after following a digital assessment strategy, assessment uh, we did and develop a master plan and also a strategy on digital ID with the support of UNECA. So I want to thank uh, Matal Sek who has been very instrumental um, in that. And the digital ID is, uh, is very important for us to um, achieve and tremendous efforts uh, in, in play to ensure we have a quick implementation of a digital ID in, in, in the Gambia. Although we know we have challenges of coordination and cooperation because uh, digital ID entails uh, putting together a lot of um, data needs that feed into the digital ID of an individual. And some of these things are resident in, in different uh, ministries or entities that we need to work together with and see how we integrate that. And I think Matar has given an example how we want to utilize our existing uh, digital addressing system to be part of that digital ID, how the SIM registration platform we have, how we integrate that uh, into the digital ID. Uh, the the birth, the birth registrations, uh, the passport ID, and our bank accounts. So all these need coordination and collaboration, and we we're really working um, to to ensure that is done. Um, after that, we also talking about fintechs and financial inclusion, and the issue of establishing a national um, switch um, is really paramount to be able to promote the creation of payment gateways and the use of those gateways. Um, to facilitate um, financial inclusion, digital financial inclusion in the uh, country. But beyond that, to see how we also facilitate cross-border payments within um, the, the African countries, especially under the initiative of the free trade area, um, these payment um, gateways would be very useful and cross-border um, payment. So we are now with the challenges we have is the in the area of cyber cyber security issues and what we are doing is that we need to ensure when we put these things in place the trust of the trust and confidence of the people does not wane and to do that we are working on a cyber crime bill which is already 
um, on its way to the National Assembly. So I'm sure Honorable Mbo will be expecting that bill. Uh, we will need his support uh, in ensuring that we get that bill enacted the, the, in the quickest possible time. And we also established a cyber crime um, or cyber security um, emergency response teams, you know, to be able to respond to some of the threats uh, we may we may be faced with um, in, in the country. Now, when you come to uh, about inclusion, the issue of not only uh, the digital divide where the infrastructure reaches our people, and as already indicated by Henry Bumbo, that we have the broadband networks that is all around the country, but the last mile is still um, a challenge, and we are working on strategies to see how we overcome that using diff different technologies, um, mixed technologies that would help us achieve that. And even apart from the last mile, the devices, affordability of the devices um, is, a, is a challenge we've identified. And uh, we see how we work together with, with providers of devices to see how we can have affordable devices or even to have um, devices that could be um, programmed in a way that could be used by our um, disadvantaged um, people. So um, we mentioned about change strategy. I think it's a very, um, very important in digital transformation because um, we want, if we want inclusiveness, we need to make sure everybody participates in this. And to do so, we, we need to find a way of encouraging and making sure everybody participates and the digital transfer agenda of the AU by 2030 is met through the full participation of each and every African and every person um, in, in the world by extension. So we are also working on e-applications and services. And I think here our consideration at the Development Ministry um, is to ensure um, that we develop applications that suit our needs, okay. applications that suit our needs, that can address our problems, our local problems. We, we're working together also to see how we collaborate with other bilateral partners, like technologies that are working in some of our partner countries, we see how we adopt them, you know, rather rather than inventing the wheel. And in doing so, um, our minister has signed um, MOUs with, with Rwanda, with Mauritius, uh, with Nigeria, and we're working on um, adopting the MyGov um, platform of Bangladesh, so that we have a quick way of uh, adopting these um, e-applications and platforms to attain our digital transformation agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Lemmin, very much. You, you touched on a couple of topics that have popped up repeatedly. Uh, not only governance, as in who does what, when, who finances what, but also softer elements like coordination and collaboration between different stakeholders, both within the greater ecosystem of the public sector, so local, regional, national authorities, um, but also with the private sector, like the financial sector, for both for uh, data exchange and for facilitating payment systems, regulatory framework standards, and compliance we know is traditionally a challenge. We are very good in the public sector, and I talk as a civil servant, at writing ambitious, beautiful strategy documents. It's a little bit more difficult to ensure that all the camels line up and all the ducks are lined up in a row. So with 10 minutes left, I'd like to throw the question to, to, to the panel, and maybe start with Luis and then, then go to Jaume and Rose and, and then back to the panel here. Um, what are the governance and collaboration mechanisms that need to be in place to ensure this holistic whole of government approach, this full socioeconomic public sector transformation in our countries. Is it enough that it's just one ministry that does this? Or is there, there tricks up the sleeve in terms of the mandates, the collaboration mechanisms, and the link to these governance and, and strategy frameworks that you've seen work well um, from your different perspectives? Luis, then Rose, Jaume. Okay, I, I, if I may, I, I would like to connect your question to this um, other question on democracy that you, you, you put, because uh, of course the potential of digital technology is enormous, 
uh, but there are no free lunches, and that's, that's the point that Morten was, was trying to make. Uh, we know, for example, in, in terms of digital governance mechanisms, of course, if you go digital, you will enforce a number of formalization of procedures that actually contribute to accountability, transparency, all these. But on the other hand, to make this effective, we need these instances of corporations. Uh, João talked in his first, uh, in first, um, when in his first uh, intervention, he mentioned the need for management capabilities of the whole system and articulation of different ministries and different agencies. I will <coughs> also add uh, the, the relevance of, um, uh, of the political will behind this transformation, which is crucial in the success of most of these initiatives. Um, and also uh, other elements, for example, the construction of collective trust. And this is something that if actually citizens see uh, their lives being changed by this sort of technologies, the trust in the institutions increase and this actually make a difference. And a topic that Maktar mentioned, uh, uh, collected with digital misinformation, which is absolutely crit critical if you want to take this forward towards more democratic and uh, um, uh, accountable um, issues. Uh, a, a second comment, if I, if I, if I may, I, I have two, two very brief comments. Uh, one was just to, to go back to the point of literacy that was also mentioned as a uh, kind of a key enabler of all this. Uh, I, I would like just to stress uh, something that actually uh, worries me when, when dealing with, with most African countries, which is what are the mechanisms that we have in practice to attract and to maintain very specialized, very technical skills that did exist in Africa and that are very easily gone to the private sector or even abroad. So this is uh, something, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a very good resource, a natural resource. And the, second, and the last comment is about identity, digital identity, that is absolutely crucial as well. Uh, in, the, in the Digital Governance Forum that we promote with, with Weneka in, in the Gambia last month, there was uh, a presentation of, a, of a, something that was called by then the non-authoritative uh, identity, uh, identity, the digital identity. That was a project, a pilot project in some African countries to, to uh, resort to, the community, to local communities to help in building in an informal way um, digital identity records for a lot of people that are actually like lag lagging behind the, um, the effort. This is something that, if you are interested, we may discuss further. Um, Rose, on governance, collaboration, any thoughts, any things that you've seen work particularly well or, or, or sort of things based on bad examples that you would do differently from your perspective? Um, I'll, I'll give you things that I, I think have worked well, and I'll give you the Kenyan perspective. Um, one of the things I've heard um, being spoken about, I think Matt had touched on it, is the um, siloed approach to government agencies, which means that there is duplication of um, certain projects, um, duplication of initiatives. Um, how this has been addressed in Kenya is obviously there is a first strategic goal that looks at um, what everyone must achieve. And in this, there's pillars, um, um, which is digital transformation, there is um, obviously universal health care, there's affordable housing and, and, and the like. Um, and in each of this, there is a ministry that is given um, effective control over how to manage that mandate. So for example, if there is a universal health project that looks at digital transformation, then the Ministry of um, Information, Communication and Digital Economy will then have a say in how that happens, meaning that there is no duplication. There is one area of access to ensure that um, projects are being run in um, in a particular way, um, funds are being allocated in that particular in, in, in to that particular project. There is expertise that's being rolled off from a ministerial level um, and also um, trickles down to, say, for example, if there's a uh, data governance issue, then the Office of Data Protection Commissioner will be involved. Um, and so that close collaboration between ministries, knowing firstly what their mandate is, um, knowing where their expertise lies and seeing how best to actually support um, rather than to carry a project um, by themselves and they might not necessarily have this expertise is something that I've seen that is actually really beneficial um, in ensuring that we're moving forward with some of these um, um, strategies uh, without um, unnecessary duplication. 
Uh, thank you, Rhodes. It's actually this matrix of, of, of different responsibilities. The Ministry of Education knows education. The Ministry of Technology knows technology, and when they two combine, they need to collaborate. This is a success factor when in place, we've seen in many countries, both in Africa and elsewhere, um, in, in the UNU system. So very happy to hear that this is also something that we see uh, in, in a place like Kenya. Um, Jaume, any thoughts on, 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 again, this sort of division of responsibility? How do you, how do you get your ducks in a row? Uh, how do you hurt the cats, so to speak? Uh, government is a multi-headed beast sometimes with many different actors, different levels of autonomy, different interests. So, so from your perspective in Cap Verde, with your experience, what, what gets the ducks in a line uh, in your context and, and, and what do you see working uh, when it comes to this? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the governance uh, <laughs> it plays a critical role in, in all of this. Uh, but um, you have to put this, these governments in, in, uh, in such a way that the people see the benefits. So what we do here in Cap Verde, we create our uh, strategy for digital uh, governance with the UNU EGOV, but with Luis as well. And uh, what we do, we, we take uh, all the, the, the goals that all the sectors have, and we bring it to the, the strategy. And right now they are included in, in, in the strategy that we put in place. With this, we provide some regulations as well. So right now, if you if you want to to have a new project, um, first it must uh, send to to our cabinet to to analyze and and validate the integrations if there's no duplications, um, and validate the outcome as well uh, before uh, the implementation. So uh, I think we, we work in the two different levels. We work in the level that we bring the people, the, the, all the sectors to this digital transformation, but we made some regulations as well in terms of how, uh, what they can do, how they can do. And we are working as well in terms of the standards of the use of the technology. Uh, we, we don't have it right now uh, completely uh, regulated, but we work on that as well as right now we have some guidance um, to, to ensure that what we do uh, today will, will be um, sustainable in the future. Um, some, some, someone mentioned the legacy systems uh, in Europe and things like that. We don't uh, want to, to, to have a lot of different systems um, we have the, the our um, interoperability framework, but it's easy if you can integrate it without um, a, a lot of, of different things. So we try to manage uh, all these things uh, with the regulation and with the proximity to, to all the sectors. Thanks, John. We, we have a couple of minutes left, so I want to ask the, the panel that's actually here in Kyoto, Anan, Luis, Magda, any any final thoughts? Um, anything that that our audience could could contact, for instance, an echo on if they have questions around frameworks and 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 tools that Uneka provides uh, to help support the national transformation. Um, Just before I want to highlight uh, the Kenya model, I think Rose uh, highlight very well this. Uh, it is uh, something we can uh, look at as an example uh, for other African country, uh, as well as uh, the, 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 met the, the, the example of uh, Rwanda. And uh, we have uh, seen the result in, uh, in Kenya. I think uh, if I don't have a mistake, I think the G ICT contribute around 10% of the GDP. It is a good result uh, coming from this uh, coordination mechanism. And uh, also uh, mobile money, I think we have uh, today 98% of Kenya using mobile mo money and 
65% uh, six, have access to internet. It is uh, some result we can highlight across uh, the continent. At ECA, we are here to support uh, all African countries in the digital era, uh, at the policy level, at the capacity building, uh, as, well, as well as the, uh, to, to, to raise the voice of Africa. At the policy level, uh, we support African countries develop their national digital transformation strategy, cy cyber security, e-commerce strategy, fintech strategy, all issues related to this uh, uh, digital ID also, we support African country. All issues related to digital uh, transformation, we support African country in terms of policy related to the climate change, also uh, uh, to, 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 to education, uh, health, uh, as well as we support uh, some uh, key, pro key, key use project on digital ID. We have uh, one project, uh, key use case in, uh, in Nigeria to how to use digital uh, ID on the social sector. We can also duplicate this in several other countries. On e-agriculture, we have a big project in, uh, in Botswana, and we can support also African countries to see how we can use uh, digital technology to improve the animal sector, also the, uh, the agriculture sector. We also uh, focus on uh, capacity building, we already have this uh, artificial intelligence center in Cong in Congo. We are building now this uh, ar the cyber security center in uh, Lome, Togo, as well as the steam center in Rwanda. And also we are going to launch uh, a program uh, early next year for the parliamentary to build their capacity on uh, digital economy, digital technology, cyber security, as well as, uh, as a fintech. We have another program for the private sector with uh, Alibaba. Mm -hmm to support all the private sector in several areas. I'm going to stop there because we are, <laughs> we can, we, you, we you, go, you go <laughs> through to the <laughs> ECA website <laughs> and you will find, uh, you we can find all activity we are doing in the dig digital center of excellence of digital ID, digital trade, digital economic. Anything related to this uh, three key sector, ECA is ready to support you. Last three minutes. <laughs> Just stop there. Actually, my clock is a little bit advanced. So, Luis, ultra short because we will seconds. be cut off or we will be ending up taking the time of the next session. Sure, <laughs> sure. 30 seconds to say that when we go to the United Nations University um, unit on digital governance, we basically uh, have been investing in Africa in terms of helping countries to design national and sectorial strategies, for example, the justice, um, justice sector strategy in St. Mayan Prince was developed with us. And I, I would like to stress the relevance of these strategies, not, uh, not just as documents, but as processes that engage people, engage different stakeholders, and sometimes these processes are even more important than the, the final outcome. So, yeah, uh, uh, again, in our website you can find other, other information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. On behalf of UNECA and UNUGAV, thank you very much to the audience. Thank you, Lamine, for your patience, and also thank you to, to Minister Barr of Gambia, who unfortunately couldn't join us. Um, thank you, Rose. Thank you, Jaume. Thank you, Anan. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you all here. Any questions that you may have to us here physically, please catch us after this session. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact UNECA or UNUIGAV separately. You'll find us on our respective websites. We're happy to follow up informally with any support we can provide. Thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of the day and IGF here in Kyoto. Thank you. Bye-bye.